Welcome everyone to the next in the series of the um, Lancet Commission on Gender and Global Health. And I'm really thrilled to, uh, to introduce two speakers today, uh, Professor Sharon Friel from the um, Australian University and Dr. Sarah Hill, currently at the University of Edinburgh. And Sarah and Sharon are going to be talking about an area um, where gender, where a gender lens has been all too frequently applied, um, the commercial determinants of health. So Sarah, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. Um, it'll just take me a moment to share my screen. So um, just give me a second here. Um, sorry, having a few technical issues. <laughs> oh no, this was working perfectly before. <sighs> okay. Sarah, do you want Emma to come in and share the the, her, the slides if she has um, them? So what I might have to do, unfortunately, is I might have to leave and come back in. So apologies for that. I'll, I'll just be a second. No worries at all. Um, whilst we're waiting for, for Sarah to come back, Sharon, I wonder if you could um, just give us a, a, a 30 second introduction to your other work on the commercial determinants of health. Just a, a, a quick overview, um, perhaps even what we mean by the commercial determinants of health before Sarah um, gets into her presentation. Yeah, uh, thanks, Sarah. Um, so yeah, so for people listening in, so the commercial determinants of health, a number of different ways that that's been uh, described, but really uh, what it's all about is understanding the commercial uh, forces, the policies, the practices, and the products of the commercial sector. Uh, and of course, we're interested in how that affects health and health inequities. And what you'll hear from uh, the discussion today is uh, often we see it in a very obvious way uh, through the products of these commercial uh, forces. Uh, but as Sarah will explain, some of the work that we've been doing is really trying to unpack uh, some of the more indirect ways in which uh, commercial actors uh, and their ways of being uh, shape society, shape the working conditions, shape the expectations, the norms within society, shape the policy regulatory environment in ways that create and structure, uh, structure society and create inequities uh, within society and of course how that flows through uh, to health uh, and health equity. Some of the work that people within the, the commercial determinants of health uh, area have been focusing on, and uh, Fran Baum, also uh, one of the commissioners on this uh, Lancet Commission, really has been trying to understand all of the steps. So from the, the policies, the business models, that many industries, whether that's in the alcohol industry, the tobacco industry, the food industry, the fossil fuel industry, uh, how their policies and practices and products uh, really you know, feed into both physical and mental health. So with no further ado, and um, that was perfect timing, uh, Sarah Hill, uh, a, a lovely segue back to you to speak about and how all of that then relates uh, to gender, and particularly to women. Great, thank, thanks Sharon. Can I just check that everyone can see the PowerPoint slides now? Yes, we can, Sarah, thanks. Thanks, sorry about that. Um, prolonged uh, uh, technical glitch and well done to Sharon for having introduced it. So I think I'll, I'll go straight on to the presentation in this case. Um, 
So I'm going to talk a little bit as about following up on what Sharon said about the intersection between gender and the commercial determinants of health. But then I'm really going to focus a lot of the presentation on a case study, which is looking at how tobacco and alcohol companies have engaged with women, both in terms of shaping their, their health directly through consumption of their products, but also thinking about how those companies shape the broader structural um, drivers of gender inequities. And then we'll finish with some, some concluding reflections and, and thoughts about where we should go next. So as Sharon was saying, a social determinants perspective really emphasizes the extent to which health is influenced by a whole range of factors. So we're often trying to shift gaze beyond the sort of individual and individual lifestyle choices to consider how those are shaped and sometimes constrained by a whole range of factors, including social and community networks, broader social conditions, and ultimately the, the kind of structural and um, economic, cultural and environmental conditions in which we live. And the commercial determinants of health is a shorthand way of saying that commercial actors are very influential within those determinants. A lot of the work that's been done to date on commercial determinants of health has focused on industries that produce products that are directly harmful to health. So a lot of work comes from tobacco, alcohol, and increasingly ultra-processed food and beverage industries and the extent to which they've been implicated in the rise of non-communicable disease um, epidemics. But there's also emerging work now looking at a broader range of commercial actors and particularly thinking about industries whose products might not always have um, a direct physical effect on health, but that shape um, the broader environment in, in ways that are damaging both to health and to other social goals, um, including environmental protection and sustainability. So when we think about how the commercial determinants of health intersect with a social determinants understanding, we can see that they've really got a cross-cutting influence. So commercial determinants um, can be seen as, as shaping individual preferences, shaping physical and social environments, but they also play an important role in influencing public policy and influencing global policy in ways that are often a bit more hidden from view. In terms of gender and how we're thinking about that, um, we're employing an eco-social and intersectional approach where we're really thinking about gender as socially constructed differences um, between different groups, and simplistically men and women. So we're recognising that sex also plays an important role in relation to health, but thinking about gender as something that's socially produced, that permeates across different layers of um, the social determinants of health from the kind of um, intimate relationships through communities, institutions, and, um, institu and, 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 and policies and structures. We're also recognising that gender is just one aspect of social location and identity. So while in this presentation I'm focusing very much on the way in which commercial actors interact with gender, we're also conscious that that's going to be shaped and modified by other aspects of social location. And so in some parts of the presentation you'll see um, the certainly elements of age that are very evident in some of the material I'll show, but also class and race um, are, are relevant here as well. So in thinking of gender as a social determinant of health in a probably slightly simplistic way that, that that's I'm using just as a heuristic for this analysis, uh, we're really emphasizing that gender permeates across the different domains of the social determinants of health. But in particular, we might think about gendered norms as shaping women and girls um, exposure and vulnerability to health to adverse health experiences. That's obviously not just for women and girls, it's for other gender groups as well. Um, but also that the that they that the structural determinants of health are gendered or that, that there are important um, ways in which different gender groups may be impacted differently by the way in which the, the, deter the structural determinants of health are, are shaped. So moving on to the, yeah, the right. case study. Yes. So uh, I'm really, really sorry to interrupt you, but your uh, your slides are not actually changing. Oh dear. Oh. Um, okay. Hmm. Um. Perhaps what I could do is, Sharon. I don't know if you've got a copy of the PDF that I sent you, or maybe I could send it to Emma. 
Yeah, if you send it to me, I can project that. Yeah, sure. Look, sorry, I'll send it to you just now. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, thanks for letting me know, Sarah Hawks. Right, so I'll just stop sharing my screen in that case. To, and um, while Emma is taking a moment to find those slides, so Emma, when you when you find the slides, I'm just starting on the um, the case study bit, which is sort of uh, about it's probably about slide number eight or so. So what I'm going to talk about in in the next little sh stage of the presentation is really exploring the way in which specifically the tobacco and alcohol industries have engaged with gender, particularly in marketing their products to women. And I'm gonna show quite a few examples of advertising and give you a little bit of a historical perspective of how that's changed over time. So there's a really um, interesting, in a sense, story here to tell about how in the early part of the 20th century, the tobacco industry recognized that women were a really significant market um, for them, but the one that was like had largely been unrealized at that stage. So up, up until then, smoking had been very much a, a male activity. And then in the early part of the 20th century, tobacco companies started putting a lot of effort into trying to recruit women as smokers. And so the way in which they um, marketed to women really reflects their engagement with gender and gendered norms at the time. And then a little bit later, we see the alcohol industry doing something similar, although the kinds of norms that they've used um, are a little bit different. And then what's really interesting in the case study is seeing how those, the approaches used by those industries have, have been changed over time. So in other words, there's a sense in which as gendered norms changed, particularly in high income countries, such as the United States and North America, industries also changed their marketing strategies so that they were interacting with the, the fluid nature of those gendered norms. That's great, thanks, Emma. So, so this slide is kind of reflecting the fact that tobacco companies recognised at the beginning of the 20th century that women were really a large untapped market. And they then um, set about very strategically looking to recruit women as smokers. And while now in high-income countries, women often smoke um, almost as much as men, in emerging economies, women are still fairly low tobacco users, and so they still constitute a really important potential market for these industries. If we go on to the next slide. So here I'm going to show um, the some of the early advertising that tobacco companies used to, to women, and you can see the, in these pictures from the 1920s that um, this was some of the very earliest advertising to women. It looks a little bit crude to us now, but it's very easy to see how the industry was playing on dominant gendered norms at the time. So there's very much an emphasis on smoking as being something that's associated with physical attractiveness. It's enabling women to stay lovely and slim, but it's also got this slight association with sort of um, sexual allure or, or being attractive to the opposite sex. And if we go on to the next slide, you'll see that when the alcohol industry started advertising to women, they used a slightly different approach. So their advertising appeared a bit later. And rather than trying to associate alcohol initially as something that was going to increase physical attractiveness, they took a really different strategy. So they, these advertisements are really seeing, portraying women much more as um, uh, housewives or hostesses. Alcohol here is seen as something that's consumed in a home environment and, and as part of being sociable. Next slide, please, Emma. Um, <clears throat> and then interestingly, we see that the, the way in which gender is invoked in these advertisement changes changes over time. So for tobacco, um, we've moved away here. This is in the, thir the 30s on the left and then quite a bit later, the early 1980s on the right. We've really moved away here from the idea that product use is enhancing women's attractiveness to the opposite sex. And here it's being portrayed much more 
as something that's for their own um, gratification. So back in the 1930s, we've got this housewife taking a break from hoovering um, to sit down and have a nice cigarette and that the advertisement is sort of saying she needs to look after herself and take a lesson from her spaniel. Um, and then in the early 1980s, um, a, a slightly different framing, but again, this idea that product use is about looking after yourself, it's about self-gratification. So here we've got this busy mother, she's seen the kids off to school, the husband off to the office, now she's taking a moment for herself. Next slide, please, Emma. And we sort of see a similar transition in a way happening in alcohol advertising. So um, the two ads here, although they appeared alongside each other, they actually came from different periods. So the ad on the left is um, a um, Budweiser ad from the 1960s, and this fits much more with that traditional approach to, to advertising. The woman, again, is being portrayed as this um, uh, homemaker she's serving alcohol along with this delicious uh, stew for her husband when he comes home from work and then interestingly the, the same company has employed an agency to use to even sort of critique that ad a little bit themselves in 2019 by producing an ad that actually uses the same woman to some extent but now she's presented as drinking the alcohol herself and so again we've moved from women being portrayed as uh, in a caring role and now they're consuming these products in their own right, and it's for their own gratification. Next slide, please. We see some really interesting um, things happening then in, as we get further into the 20th century. So in particularly in the 1980s, there was a move towards engaging with ideas of, of women's empowerment and liberation in advertising. So here we see almost a, a kind of... Um, uh, playing up of those earlier ads. And we're here, we're here these women who are, are smoking are uh, very much being portrayed as sort of independent and not smoking. The smoking is not in order to increase their physical attractiveness to the opposite sex. Allegedly, although of course, the women in these ads are still young, they're still very physically attractive, um, and they are still probably conforming to sort of heterosexual norms of, of sexual attractiveness. Um, but it's interesting to see how the industries have, um, or the advertisers have recognised changing gender norms and are seeking to engage or present themselves perhaps as more progressive companies in order to market their products. Um, and then in the next slide, please, if we, this is almost a sort of front stage part that we're seeing here. These advertisements are obviously how advertisers are looking to project these industries. But if we look at behind the scenes, if we look at the backstage, of how the industries themselves are talking about these advertisements, we see a really different picture. So here I'm drawing from um, internal in tobacco industry documents that were hidden at the time, but were subsequently made publicly available after a legal case in the late 1990s. And so if we go back and look at some of the internal industry documents, how are these executives talking about these advertisements themselves? It's very, very clear that they were playing on these changing norms in order to market their products. Um, and there's a particularly interesting quote here, which comes from um, a, Phil, a Philip Morris advertiser who was thinking about advertising this Virginia Slims campaign in the magazine Ebony, which is very much targeted towards African-Americans in the United States. And you can see from the quote here that the executives is saying, look, here's a Virginia Slims ad for Ebony. Frankly, we weren't sure with our theme, you've come a long way, baby, that we could run this in ebony. So they're obviously concerned that it's actually going to make them look a little bit too uh, progressive or a little bit that there's going to be sectors of the population that, that see them as um, uh, engaging in, in something slightly controversial. But then they say, oh, no, we, we figured why not, as long as it still comes off as a cigarette ad, not a civil rights message. So there's a really interesting sense here of the, if you like, the kind of corporate cynicism perhaps that lies behind the promotion of progressive gender norms at what was seen as progressive at the time, that it's very much intended um, to sell the product, not as some kind of um, um, act of solidarity with, with actual changing um, uh, social ideas and norms. Next slide, please, Emma. And in more recent um, times, and I'll probably try and get through these slides reasonably quickly, we, we sort of see a similar thing. So we can go on to the next one, thanks Emma, where we see not only now that these companies um, present their advertisements in ways that are meant to portray them as progress progressive, 
but also that they increasingly engage in um, social responsibility activities. And in fact, they also support causes that are very much intended to present them as progressive companies, particularly in relation to, uh, to gender issues. So International Women's Day earlier this year was some of the major supporters included Diageo and McDonald's. If we go on to the next slide, um, we also see these companies uh, such as um, alcohol companies, such as Diageo, one of the, the, the world's leading spirits producer, specifically launching campaigns that are not presented as advertising campaigns, but are clearly intended to associate their brands with ideas of progress. Of progress. So for example, um, Diageo, the, jo the Johnny Walker label issued a, a, a special edition whiskey called Jane Walker, which was intended to sort of portray the company as um, celebrating women and women's achievements. And for a really interesting critique of that campaign, I, I would point you to a, a, a very interesting Stephen Colbert episode, which I've put the link up for there. Um, and we've even seen tobacco companies, which now in many countries are unable to advertise directly, finding ways to spread their brands through supporting things like International Women's Day um, and mounting corporate um, activities that are, that are meant to um, portray themselves as trying to support women's empowerment within the organisation. Next slide, please, Emma. Um, Alongside this, we see these companies entering into partnerships, often with um, non-governmental organisations in order to support causes that themselves are um, focused very much on issues of gender empowerment or, or things that would be seen as being women's issues. So here on the left, we've got a um, partnership between Diageo and, and CARE, uh, which is an international charity that looks to um, try and promote women's empowerment. Um, and again, there's this sort of front stage, backstage sense where on in the campaign materials, this is seen as supporting women's empowerment. If we look at how DIGO is talking about this to their investors, they are um, really recognizing the extent to which women's empowerment means that women then become economically independent and also therefore become consumers in their own rights. So again, that kind of sense of um, there being a, a sort of hidden agenda behind this. And then on the right, we see this really interesting example where um, uh, AB InBev company, Carling Black Label, collaborated with a local charity in South Africa to um, <clears throat> mount a campaign against gender-based violence. And this, again, is a really interesting thing to, to, to think about in terms of how the company is supporting a really um, important cause, but in ways that are intended to perhaps reposition its own role in, um, in domestic violence, uh, which is a bit of a theme in terms of, of how the, the types of causes that these companies focus on. So then if we go to the next slide, Emma. So to sort of summarise this um, brief uh, um, tour through the ways in which alcohol and tobacco companies advertise their products and also engage in CSR activities, um, we can see um, that they do that in ways that both engage with but also potentially reinforce dominant gender norms, but also seek to recruit women as consumers in their own right. And also, as, as reflected in this slide here, often they um, where they do engage with ideas where they're trying to um, engage with ideas of, of women's health or, or, or healthy consumption of products, they're doing it in ways that reinforce a concept of individual responsibility. So we see on the left a really interesting campaign um, funded by the alcohol industry, which again sort of gives us the sense of the responsible drinking woman who's this lovely, wholesome um, woman and having her Guinness, whereas compared with irresponsible drinking women. So, um, you know, women drinking to excess or as in the little um, drink aware sign, you can see pregnant women, that, that sign of the pregnant woman um, is, appears on lots and lots of alcohol products in, in the UK in a way that I think is really interesting in its framing of responsibility um, and who is regarded as a problem drinker. Um, next two slides, actually. So what I've shown you is perhaps the more visible side of how these industries engage with gender and with girls and women, which is very much to do with their um, advertising their products and also portraying themselves as progressive organisations. But another sort of aspect of our analysis is really trying to think 
a bit more about the structural um, determinants of health and the ways in which the activities of these companies also reinforce gender inequities that arise from the way in which society is uh, structured and organised. And here I think um, it's always worth thinking about the ways in which dominant political economic systems impact on, on women. Um, and as Enlo says here, not just on women, but also in certain kinds of relations between women and men. Um, next slide, please, Emma. So here, it, while there's much less um, evidence here and it's hard to show really compelling empirical examples, we're really drawing on this idea that a market society tends to operate in ways that often systematically disadvantage women. So to the extent to which commercial markets become privileged within society or societies end up being um, constructed in ways that, that privilege market freedoms, we end up in a, in a situation where roles traditionally undertaken by women are relatively undervalued. Um, and the scope for um, the state perhaps to um, invest in essential services and so forth is, tends to be paired back in ways that, that leave particularly girls and women vulnerable. Next slide. Um, actually, next couple of slides would be good. So the ways in which the alcohol and tobacco companies um, reinforce that sort of market privilege includes the ways in which they engage with um, policy makers. So they um, directly engage to, in order to try and um, prevent re regulation of their markets. Um, next slide, please. But they also seek very actively to expand their own activities into particularly emerging markets. So we see um, um, that, that when they do that, the, it affects um, not just the sort of market economy, but affects labour markets um, and the ways in ways that are particularly disadvantaging to women. So some of the um, statistics I've cited here um, represent, reflect the ways in which women become overrepresented in a casual employment and low paid employment. A lot of the work that they undertake is unpaid um, and they also have very low representation in positions of political and economic influence. So clearly these are patterns that are well known to um, any, any, anyone that works in the area of gender of gender and gender equity. Um, I guess what I'm trying to, to argue here is that it's, these things don't happen um, by accident, that there are, um, there are powerful actors whose interests are served by maintaining a system where free markets are privileged and that um, they, they are constantly working behind the scenes in order to do this. And one of the consequences of that is that it tends to increase gender inequities and in the structural determinants of health. Uh, so next two slides, thanks, Emma. So to sort of summarise the um, analysis we've presented, we're, we're very much drawing on this idea that there's, there are very visible activities that these companies engage with in relation to gender, where they're, they're playing with gender norms in order to sell their products to women, but also to portray themselves as being socially progressive companies. But at the same time, there's also a less visible side of things, which is where these particularly multinational companies are um, constantly working in ways that reinforce market privilege, that um, undermine regulation of their activities, and that therefore they're also contributing to structural inequities that are really important in understanding um, the impacts, the, the, in understanding women and women's health and, and the health of other um, gender identities as well. So then next slide, please. So to sort of summarise that um, from a social determinants perspective, we're, we're sort of reminding ourselves that the activities of these companies permeate across a whole different range of determinants. And that while the things that are perhaps most visible and most compelling are focused perhaps on individuals and on societies and communities, that's where we see these very sophisticated advertising campaigns and CSR campaigns. At the same time, there's a whole lot of activities happening behind the scenes that are less visible to us, that, but that are also very pervasive and important in terms of their, their impacts um, because they're, they're increasing gender inequities in the political, economic and social determinants of health. Um, and then next two slides and then that'll be the last one. Um, so in terms of how we respond to that, I think from a public health perspective, we would probably look to both um, continue monitoring the activities of these industries and perhaps raise 
awareness of the extent to which a lot of their practices are um, problematic from a health perspective and from a gender equity perspective. Um, and I think there's a real need here to call out um, the, these actors that are looking to undermine regulation of their activities and to um, point out that there are a lot of very broad consequences of that that are problematic from both a health and a gender perspective. And then next slide. Um, but I also think there's a discussion for us to have about where we want to go next as researchers, what, what kinds of evidence we need um, in order to better inform efforts to resist, I guess, the, the, um, the adverse impacts of, 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 indis of these commercial determinants on gender equity and, and health. And I think while in this presentation we focus very much on the way in which these companies engage with women and with gender norms around um, femininity, there's also a lot of interesting work to be done, I think, looking at how they engage with ideas of masculinity in ways that are also um, problematic and harmful to men and to boys. Um, I think it would be really helpful to have more evidence about the, the kind of structural impacts of these industries. So to have a, a more detailed understanding of what happens when these large multinational companies move, particularly into low and middle income settings, what are the consequences in terms of um, labour markets, in terms of economic um, uh, resources, particularly from a gendered perspective? And also, of course, we need to have a better understanding of how policymakers, advocates and communities can mitigate the negative impacts of corporate activities and also perhaps um, look to find alternative ways of, um, of, of, of engaging with gender in, in ways that, that don't sort of reinforce a very kind of neoliberal economic paradigm, but that shift our understanding of, of gender and gender norms away from simply one of individual identity to, to a more collective understanding. Um, so I'll, I'll finish there and pass over to Sharon for um, some more comments and I'll do my best to stop the, the, the screen the, uh, the screen sharing. <laughs> oh, Lovely. Thanks, Anna. I could listen to you uh, talking about all of that for for hours. Um, really, all, all I wanted to do was just reflect. So for us uh, in this Lancet Commission, you were thinking about the and understanding the differential health outcomes uh, you know, across uh, gender. Uh, really, I hope, uh, as Sena has outlined, the compelling argument for why we have to pay attention to these commercial forces. And if there was ever any doubt that uh, just, just a focus on the products of companies uh, being in, uh, related to, to health, I, I think what uh, Sarah has just shown is that is absolutely the tip of the iceberg. It's very, very important, uh, but it's the, the tip of the iceberg. And to really understand how uh, commercial forces are not only affecting uh, gender health uh, through the, the products avenue, but also that structuring of society and really shaping the policy and the regulatory and environment. And uh, I mean, I think it's understandable in the field of the commercial determinants of health uh, within, as a sort of a subfield of, of public health, uh, we have really focused on the products um, I think for us in this Lancet Commission, this would be a real opportunity to advance that field very significantly and not just focus on products, but really how commercial forces structure society and what that means uh, for health. And then also how gender forces uh, really shape policy and regulatory uh, environments and how that flows through to health. And we can't do that without explicit attention to power. Sarah has really shown that the, the structural power of the commercial forces, the institutional, the instrumental power of these commercial actors and their discursive power, the ideational power, uh, how they, again, uh, how all of that flows into product uh, desirability, the, the shape of policy and regulatory environments, uh, and just the whole structure uh, of society. So really, for us uh, within this Lancet uh, Commission, I, I really hope that we'll um, 
shine a, a very important light, light uh, on these commercial forces as a major, major uh, driver of the differential health outcomes that we're seeing globally. Sarah and Sharon, thank you so much. That was an absolutely brilliant overview of, uh, I think, as I, I said right at the start, an area where the gender lens has been all too frequently shone in the, in the public health sphere. Um, I've just got, a, a, I realise that we, we, we have run over time. Um, I've got a very quick recommendation, which is a recommendation that I, I um, usually give to, to, to students as a sort of, okay, if you're watching on YouTube, um, here's another YouTube recommendation for you. And it's, um, it's a documentary by a guy called Adam Curtis. Um, and it's called The Century of the Self. And it's the history of Edward Bernays, who was the nephew of Freud and is sort of seen as the father of public relations. Um, and I mean, it goes into a, a huge amount of detail about the, 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 the practice of public relations. But Edward Bernays was the first person who really used the methods of um, psychoanalysis to appeal to the emotional side of people um, to get them to desire a product. And the first company that he was employed by to use these new ideas in the 1920s were the, it was the tobacco industry. So he's the person who really kind of kick-started the entire um, selling of tobacco products as something that was a, a desirable product for, for women. So there, there's, a, there's a great uh, documentary exploring that called The Century of the Self, which I'd really encourage everybody, once you've um, finished looking at all of the Lancet seminars on the YouTube channel, that you might also want to explore Adam Curtis's is um, Century of the Self documentary. So just, to, just as a really, really quick final question, and it's a very complex question, I realise, but a, a sort of one, sec what, what, one sentence summary. You've really clearly outlined that the commercial sector has been acutely aware of the concept of gender and the exploitation, the manipulation, the shifting, the power to shift and change gender norms, why has public health been so um, completely <laughs> uh, unaware of, of, the, of the power of gender, of, of the power of gender and the power of, of, of manipulating, shifting, changing gender norms in the same way? What explains that difference, do you think? A starter for 10, I guess. <laughs> Uh, look, I think that's a really good question, Sarah, and I think probably something that I'd point out is that um, a lot of public health has traditionally come from quite a biomedical perspective, or at least that's, you know, where it's kind of or its origins have been, and that for that reason we've tended to focus very much on individual choice um, as something that is very understandable, it's visible to individual practitioners, you know, why this person smokes and that person doesn't. And But perhaps that means we've been a little bit blind to the broader um, contextual factors that are shaping and constraining those choices. And so for me, I think part of the answer to that is about getting public health to shift its gaze, you know, upstream to, to, to recognise a social determinants model. Um, but I also think there's interesting things to, for us to learn from advocacy organisations that have perhaps looked to engage with gender in more... Um, sophisticated ways and so I really you know would encourage people to look at the presentation from um, Gary last week from um, Promundo where I think that 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 idea of engaging with gender in ways that are that are tra gender transformative is, is a really promising way forward. I totally agree. So an encouragement to everybody <laughs> watching this uh, on, on our YouTube channel to, to explore all of the other uh, seminars, as well as re-watching 
this seminar to really um, engage with the incredibly sophisticated way that that um, industry has been able to to understand and use gender and to think about what that means for us in public health moving forward. So thank you again, Sarah and Sharon, and thank you to everybody who's joined us watching this seminar.